they're learning and they're using words like perseverance, they're using words like empathy. It's all the character education. And they're following people that are out there in the real world doing real things. We find out that it is not only about us, it is about everyone else. The kids are following Elliot, but they're also going to be traveling with him, and that's the magic of it all, is that he makes you feel like you're there. To get to see, I did this, and this is the result, and these children are benefiting because of what I did. All the technology is fantastic, and it really appeals to today's learner. This has been a really unifying experience for the whole school. He's shown us that one person can do so much of a difference, and that I can too. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine. Imagine standing 28,500 feet above sea level. And you're in an area called the death zone. Now the reason why they call it the death zone is because your body literally starts to die. And you are dressed like a spaceman, and you're wearing moon boots, and you're breathing supplementary oxygen through a mask and cylinder that you've been carrying on your back for the past 24 hours. And stretched out for as far as the eye can see is literally an endless horizon, a forest of mountains beneath you. And directly above, 500 feet away, is what they refer to as the pinnacle of mountaineering, the highest point on planet Earth, 29,035 feet above sea level. Now, if you could believe it, just a few years prior to that moment, I had never even slept in a tent. So the question you're probably asking yourselves is, why? Why would anybody want to climb Mount Everest? Well, Sir George Mallory, a famous British mountaineer in the 1920s who disappeared near the summit of Everest, gave a legendary response. Because it is there. I'll tell you, my reasons had everything to do with the dream, but it was a dream that belonged to a very special friend of mine named Dr. Sean Egan. So I first met Sean at the age of 63 years old, and at the time, he was a professor of human kinetics at the University of Ottawa. And Sean was a former boxer. He was an incredible athlete. He ran countless marathons. And he was known to push his body to incredible extreme limits in order to render the seemingly impossible possible. And Sean had the wildest dream. And his dream was to become the oldest Canadian to summit the world's tallest mountain. And so there I was, 26 years old, at this point in my life where I was searching for something more. And that something more came in the form of a phone call from Dr. Sean Egan. And he basically said to me, do you want to go to Mount Everest? I need a cameraman. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, first of all, I don't even know where Mount Everest is. Um, I've never been to a third world country, and I've never even slept in a tent. So the real question was, how could I possibly say no? So with two weeks notice, I let my employees know, and I literally leapt off the cliff of uncertainty and decided to dance in the complete unknown. And this is what it looked like. And so Nepal felt like the land that time forgot. And in many ways, I felt as though I was living what Joseph Campbell refers to as the hero's journey. And I answered this call to adventure and left the ordinary world behind. And it was incredibly humbling because there I was amidst the highest mountains on planet Earth, literally immersed in a culture with values that I did not understand. And it reminded me of how minuscule we truly are. And so began a fellowship between Dr. Egan and I of man, mountain, and mentor. And so in many ways, as an adventure filmmaker, this was like a dream come true, because it was as though everywhere I pointed my lens, there was this incredible image to capture and this profound story to tell. And I was the guy that had just left the Western world behind, and I had just purchased this brand new car and all these trendy new clothes, and then all of a sudden, none of it mattered. And as I trek closer to Mount Everest Base Camp, I began to realize 
that Dr. Egan's mission was not about standing on top of the world. It was about using the platform of Everest to inspire people to get fit and to get active and to live healthier, happier, more meaningful lives. And that was the point that truly resonated with me at that time because I realized that my life was void of meaning. And so after 12 days of trekking through the majestic Himalayas, we finally reached Mount Everest Base Camp, and you can see the Hilton on the right there. <laughs> so I had just learned to sleep in a tent, and obviously I couldn't climb to the top of the world with Dr. Egan. So for the time being, my work would be done. And I trained his Sherpa to take my HD camera to the top of the world, and I would return to Ottawa. And I made a promise to Sean. And I said to Sean, I will do everything in my power to help you tell your story. And so there I was back in Ottawa, literally feeling like I was on top of the world. And I realized that I was truly a part of something larger than myself. And I was finally, in some small way, making a difference in the world. And that's when the phone call came in. And on April 29th, 2005, at 6.30 a.m., Dr. Egan tragically died. And he never made it. And he died of heart failure. And I was in complete shock. And here was a man that was incredibly fit and incredibly strong, and he died living his dream. And I didn't know what to do. And I knew I had to do something. And there is this voice inside of each of us. And I decided to tune into that voice and to listen to what my heart was trying to tell me. And I decided that, never having climbed a mountain before, that I was going to retrace Dr. Sean Egan's footsteps and climb to the highest point on planet Earth, video camera in hand, in order to honor his life and make a film as a tribute to him. Now, to make a very long story short, in order to make this happen, I took the biggest risk of my life. And I shut down my business. I cashed in my life savings, I sold my car, I sold my condo, I borrowed $38,000 from my best friends, which I don't recommend anyone ever do. Um, and before I knew it, I found myself back on the slopes of Mount Everest as a first-time climber. And my journey began where Dr. Sean Egan's journey, tragically, came to an end. And so against all odds, seven weeks into that expedition, 28,000 500 feet above sea level, just 500 feet shy of the top of the world. My expedition leader and best friend dramatically removes his oxygen mask. And he says to me, Elia, we will make it to the top of the world, but we will die upon descent due to the changing weather. What do you choose? <laughs> Seems rather obvious sitting here in this room listening to this. And I made the most difficult decision that I've ever had to make. And I turned around and I saved my life. And I had a photograph of Sean and I pulled out that photograph which represented Sean and I started to cry because I felt like I had let Sean down and I felt like a complete failure. I was completely broken and I narrowly escaped Everest with my life. And so what do you do? You get back home, you have absolutely nothing. There's no more business, there's no more condo, there's no more means to support yourself. And you are completely devastated. And so I began sharing this journey of finding life and the story of discovering who we are. And ironically, the only audience that didn't see this as a failure were school children. And they completely resonated with this idea of climbing mountains and realized that they too were climbing mountains every single day of their lives. I mean, after all, what is life but an upwards climb? And so the response was completely overwhelming. And then all of a sudden they were asking questions like, well, how do we get involved? And how can we make a difference? And how can we take part in your adventures? And of course, I had absolutely no idea how I was going to involve students at the time. But all of a sudden I started to realize that perhaps these obstacles, perhaps these setbacks, perhaps these detours, perhaps they were gifts in disguise as a means to propel me in the direction that I was destined to travel. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I began to climb. Literally from the highest point in North America to Europe, to the highest point in South America, to the highest point in Africa, to the sixth highest point on planet Earth. And each and every single one of these expeditions served as an opportunity to test pilot 
an experiential learning program that I call Finding Life. And we combine adventure, technology, education, and charitable initiatives in order to inspire positive change in young people. And in order to take this experiential learning program to incredible new heights, we partnered with the world's largest K-12 social network, ePals, and we launched a return trip to the summit of Mount Everest where literally thousands of students could follow along in real time. And we would be using geomapping technology, blogs, video webisodes, and Skyping opportunities in order to make learning the incredible adventure that it should be. And so the first obstacle that we had to face was something called the Kumbu Icefall. Now imagine this flowing river of ice that moves at the rate of one meter per day. And so the way I depicted this is I said, you know, imagine you're like this ant in this jumbo-sized bag of popcorn. And at any moment, anything can shift, and the popcorn are these giant seracs. And you are literally clipped into this fixed line, and you're navigating these ice cliffs, and you're negotiating vertical and horizontal ladders that are suspended over open crevasses. And I'll tell you, when you have the responsibility of thousands of students on your shoulders and you look down, your life literally flashes before your eyes. And this is what it looked like. So imagine the moment you step onto one of these ladders and you look down, your life literally flashes before your eyes. And so what you feel is the sense of paralysis and you fear the sense of fear that all of a sudden begins to overtake you and you really have two choices. Is you let that fear overtake you or you take that fear and you channel that fear into incredible strength. And so each of these obstacles on Everest became an opportunity to bring to life characteristics that are so important to instill in young people today, from determination to perseverance to optimism to teamwork and to empathy. And now, of course, it wasn't always so dramatic. There was the giant ice cream cone in the Kumbu Icefall. Um, there was our friendly neighborhood base camp heater who resembled a Pixar character named Wally. Um, there were the constant questions of where you shower and how you get hot water and where you do your laundry and, of course, the infamous question of where you go to the bathroom. Um, and, of course, these conversations, many of them very profound, are all taking place via Skype literally 6,400 meters above sea level on the highest mountain on planet Earth. Now, when we dream of Everest, we dream of transcendence. We dream of what we might become. We dream of the infinite possibility that exists within all of us. And that, in many ways, ladies and gentlemen, was part of the message that I was sharing with young people. To discover who they are, to always aim high, to recognize the infinite strength and capacity that exists within all of us to overcome the greatest of challenges, to reach for the stars, and to climb. And so seven weeks into that expedition, we were once again back in the death zone, 26,000 feet above sea level. And despite the fact that it was minus 40 degrees and we could barely feel our fingers and we could barely feel our toes, and despite the fact that there was less than one-third the level of oxygen in the atmosphere compared to sea level, it was as though there was no pain, there was no struggle. There was only mind, body, and spirit connection. And it was as though we were literally catapulted up that mountain. And before we knew it, we were witnessing one of the most incredible and glorious sunrises on planet Earth. And we had come face to face with the Hillary Step, the very final obstacle first surmounted 60 years ago by Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. And ironically, it was the exact same point that we turned around just three years before. And with the emotions running incredibly high, it's incredibly humbling because you look down to your left and there is a 10,000 foot drop into Nepal, and you look down to your right and there's a 12,000 foot drop into Tibet. And all you can do is focus intensely on the present moment, literally taking one tiny step by step 
and inch by inch and breath by breath with the entire planet beneath us at 622 in the morning after a five-year journey, ladies and gentlemen. We finally made it to the top of the world. And so being in the oxygen-deprived state that I was, and being the technology enthusiast that I am, I pulled out my iPhone, and I tweeted, top of the world. And it was an incredible feeling because I could hear the cheers of hundreds of students connected via satellite phone a world apart that were in a gymnasium in my hometown of Ottawa, Canada. And this was our victory. And as I had overcome my challenges, students had also overcome theirs. And after a few moments, I realized that I had yet one more responsibility. And we had set up this interactive forum that gave students a voice. And students decided what it was that we should do the moment we reached the top of the world. And so if I can quote James B., he says, if he reached the summit and started dancing, I would be amazed. So ladies and gentlemen, you have to forgive me. This is my America's Got Talent dance audition. Top of the world! Uh, not Donna. I promised I would dance it. That was the worst dance ever. Now I'm going to pass out because I have no oxygen. Woo! Oh, God. Please don't post that. Anymore. Go, you guys. Oh, I'm so tired. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, in many ways that day, I felt as though I fulfilled not just one promise, but two promises. And the second one to was to my friend, Dr. Sean Egan, who I knew in that moment was looking down upon me. And I knew he was smiling, and I knew he was incredibly proud. And it was a very sad moment for me in many ways because this was Sean's dream. And I feel incredibly privileged to have discovered my life's purpose by helping him fulfill his dream. And I often ask myself, what would have happened had I not have said yes? Had I not have answered that call? Well, the truth is, none of this would have happened. And you know, I all believe that we all have a purpose in our lives. And I believe it is our responsibility to identify that purpose in the shape and the form that it presents itself in our lives. And then furthermore, it's our responsibility to embrace the uncertainty that comes along with living it at the absolute highest level. Because it is then and it is there where I believe that we can truly make a difference in this world. I have one final question for you. That was my journey of finding life. What's yours? Thank you very much.